Hey everyone, before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to remind you that we have a ton of extra content over on our Patreon. We do movie watch parties, special Patreon bonus episodes, and all other sorts of wacky stuff that you can access easily if you head on over to patreon.com slash film whiskey. In 1992, director Michael Mann and star Daniel Day-Lewis gave the world a historical action drama that set the formula of similar films for years to come. In 2023, we returned to Scotland to try a puzzling whiskey. (laughs) The the film is The Last of the Mohicans. The whiskey is Glenlivet Enigma. And we'll review them both. This is The The Film Film and Whiskey Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we're looking at the 1992 historical epic, The Last of the Mohicans. Brad, this is the last episode of season six. The last of the Mo season? That we have saved the best for last, man. Yeah. I am super excited to talk about this movie, and it's for a very uh, rare reason on this show. Oh. This is my first time seeing The Last of the Mohicans. What? What? I've never seen it, man. Bob, this is a very famous movie. It is indeed. And I just like, I never happened to catch it on the cable growing up. My dad always told me it was a good movie. And so I always wanted to see it. And I love movies in this vein. Early 90s historical epics. That's like my jam. Yeah. And uh, (laughs) I've just never gotten around to seeing it. And uh, spoiler alert. We have a guest joining us today who we'll intro in just a minute. But when I heard that our guest wanted to talk about this movie, I said, well, I can't watch it now. I have to wait and and save myself for this moment. So (laughs) this is a big deal, man. Yeah, it really is. This might be the second or third time in podcast history that we've both entered, you know, the the recording booth on on equal ground. (laughs) That's true. I usually am just objectively superior to you. Well, but I, not that's today. one way of putting it. <laughs> well, maybe to balance out the playing field a little bit, we should intro our guest. It is our friend, film critic Daniel Joyo, rejoining us again uh, every year around Oscar season. Daniel, how you doing? I'm great. How about you guys? I'm doing well, man. Man, I am doing so, so good. And I'm I'm just assuming that this is your first time seeing it as well, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. So a while back, I discovered that Daniel lists this movie among his favorites of all time. And I mean, maybe it, it, would you call this your favorite film ever? Yes and no. Uh, okay. I definitely have called it that at times. I generally have like a top four in that are in some order. And it just depends on which day you catch me, which one of those four I list is my actual number one. Mm-hmm. But Last of the is one of them and does frequently get cited as my number one. That is super exciting. Well, before we dive into Last of the Mohicans, let's catch up with Daniel a little bit. You may remember him from last year when he completely fixed the Oscars and they did not heed his call at all. I don't know if what we had on Oscar bingo when uh, we talked last, but all the stuff that went down was certainly not on it. I'll say that much. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I guess that's one way to drum up ratings. You know, you came up with this complicated formula and then all you need is assault and that'll do it. So. Daniel, you're back again. It's Oscar season. You've just wrapped up uh, Sundance coverage. And it was, uh, I mean, I don't want to speak for you here. It was a pretty big deal for you, your Sundance coverage this year. Yeah, I I wrote for The Ringer for the first time, which was super exciting. Um, I think as the three of us are probably all men of a certain age and probably discovered Bill Simmons at an an early time (laughs) in college Mm -hmm. and, you know, his writing was, it mattered to us. So writing for, you know, Grantland and then The Ringer had always been a huge goal for me. So I was really mm-hmm. excited to finally do it. I wrote a big Sundance recap roundup piece for them last week. So we've got the Oscars coming up in, what, about a month now, which is, I mean, just way too late. I don't know if you agree with me on this, but a third of the way through the year seems a little bit late for the Oscars. We haven't done an Oscars preview on our podcast yet. Because like you, you know, I live in the Midwest where a lot of times the films don't come out until like February. 
I wanted to submit my 10 best of the year at the end of the year, but I don't get screeners like a lot of people do. And so I have to actually go to the theater or, you know, rent VOD. And I think the last one that I really had to catch up with was Women Talking, which I got around to seeing. I And now I feel like I'm ready to submit my top 10 of the year and it's February. So we're going to hold off a little bit on our Oscars preview. But what are some things that you're most looking forward to with this year's crop of nominees? I'm really fascinated by Best Actress. I think it's an absolute dead heat between Kate Blanchett and Michelle Yeoh. And mm-hmm. so I am, I think, you know, a lot of people are, are saying that um, everything everywhere all at once they think is the film to beat. And I think that Best Actress could be the real determination of that. You know, as you're, as you're watching the show this year, if Kate Blanchett wins, that could mean that maybe voters aren't quite as high on everything everywhere as we thought they were. Or if Michelle wins, then that could mean that that's our best picture. Yeah, I remember walking out of the theater from Everything Everywhere, and I I realized, I was like, that movie is a movie that justifies the existence of cinema. Like, (laughs) you, you couldn't tell the story they were trying to tell in any other medium. Like, I like it wouldn't work as a book or a a radio play or however else you'd want to communicate it. Like that movie just exists to be a movie. And I like, man, I just was very, very excited about that film. Yep. Totally agree. My other big Oscars question is I feel like the Banshees of Inisherin is going to win an acting Oscar, but I have Mm -hmm. no idea which one. I feel like supporting actors is still way up in the air. And I think yeah. Carrie Condon could really come in and and, and steal that. I don't want to say steal that one because it would be well-deserved. But I think, uh, once again, it all comes down to some of the major categories. Are people going to reward Brendan Fraser? Is it – I feel like The Whale has kind of fallen out of favor with a huge chunk of critics that – you know, I don't want to say they're looking down on the movie now, but will that reflect back on Brendan Fraser because he's really – you know, the only major nomination that movie gets. And if that goes to Colin Farrell, I think everything's fair game at that point, because like you're saying, everything everywhere might be in pole position right now. But I think Banshees of Inisherin is right there with it. Totally agree. All right. There you go. There's the Oscars preview for 2023. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's dive into talking about The Last of the Mohicans, Brad. And that means that it is time to segue into Brad Explains the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the film that he has just seen, often for the first time. As we know, this was your first time seeing Last of the Mohicans. Brad, before you dive into your explanation of this movie, were you familiar with the source text at all? Like, did you read the book when you were growing up? I did not read the book. Um, I was, like, culturally slightly familiar with the film. I, I knew that it was a Daniel Day-Lewis uh, uh, movie, one of his earlier ones, if, I, if I'm correct. Mm-hmm. And that it, it it's a historical, you know, French Indian War drama, and, and so that those were about the the most I was familiar with it. All right, so you went into this pretty cold, which means we should get a hell of an entertaining Brad explains out of this. <laughs> Brad, you've got sixty seconds on the clock, and go. Daniel Day Lewis is a trapper who has been adopted into a Mohican family and is conscripted by the British army into fighting against the French Huron Indian forces in the area, in the New York Territory. He initially refuses to help the British, but eventually falls in love with one of the colonel or general's daughters, and he tries to save her. The fort that they're fighting in is conquered by the French, but as they are allowed to leave peaceably, the Huron Indians attack the British Uh, in an ambush, and lots of wild things happen. Uh, He saves them once again from the Huron, has to escape them by jumping into a waterfall, and then he he goes and he goes peaceably and convinces the chief of the Huron tribe to give up the the girls, and his (laughs) his brother dies... (laughs) All right, all right, I'm going to cut you off there. Man, that thing really tailed off there at the end. There's a lot that happens in this movie, Bob. There is a lot that happens. And I I guess I'll say the first thing that really struck me about this movie, I don't want to say that the first hour and 15 minutes are slow, but there's certainly less that happens. And it just so happened that I, I had to turn the movie off for a bit at about that one hour and 15 minute mark. And it's right when they are, 
Uh, they've made their deal with the French that they're going to surrender and they're kind of leaving through that valley where they end up getting surrounded on both sides and ambushed. And it was right before that scene happened. And I see them on horseback. I had to hit pause. I came back to it. And from that moment on, there are so many developments in this movie it, and it just moves like crazy. And Brad, I feel like a broken record because this was kind of what we said about Heat last week. That first hour of the movie Heat is all set up. And then the payoff is the last two hours where it just feels like everything is flying at you at such a rapid pace. This movie felt structurally very similar to that. It's almost like it had the same director. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> who, who would have thought? <laughs> Daniel, I'm curious. I want to throw it over to you. Like, this is your favorite film. And I don't feel like I've set you up very well talking about how I like literally bifurcated this movie and came back to it. But I mean, do you see what we're talking about here? There's there's a lot of setup. And then the last 45 minutes, I thought the movie was over. And then even after that, there was another much more tragic ending that came out of it. Like it was full of surprises, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. So a few things that I just have in my you know random set of notes that I want to hit on. First of all, to your point about how fast it moves toward the end, this movie is under two hours, mm -hmm. which for a historical action epic, that's extremely rare. Yeah. Yep. And I, like by extremely rare, I mean, like maybe this is the only one. Like I, I can't off the top of my head think of another high budget by a major director Hollywood historical action movie that is under two hours. Mm -hmm. I'm, theoretically one exists, but I can't think of it. So that's already I feel like a huge point of interest in the way Michael Mann was envisioning this film, that it's unlike most historical action epics, you know, like just to throw out, say gladiator, like gladiator cares a lot about the politics of ancient Rome and mm -hmm. it peppers that into the action scenes. And you know, you end up with a two and a half hour movie. Last Mohicans does not care. Last Mohicans is purely just about the adventure iconography that Michael Mann wanted to put on the screen. And mm -hmm. the movie is that and nothing but that, which I think is part of what, I find so appealing about it. And the other thing that I want to mention is that my love for this movie, I feel like is a real relic of the channel surfing era, which is that I don't know when I saw this movie for in its entirety for the first time, but I'm almost positive. I had seen the last probably half hour, 45 minutes multiple times before I had ever seen the full thing. And I think that's, that's part of what became so, powerful about it for me is that is how perfect the ending of this film is for a long time. That was the only part of the film I knew hmm. before I eventually discovered the whole thing. I love that. Yeah. I, I have to say it reminded me so much of uh, some of those like Edward Zwick kept coming to mind his movies yeah. like this. Like it reminds me so much of glory. And even if you fast forward a few years, it reminds me a lot of the last samurai as well, but there is just like something rhythmic about these historical epics from from the late 80s to the early 2000s that I don't want to say they're all alike, but they're all kind of of a piece. And there is a very specific subgenre of historical epics that they kind of all look the same. They kind of all flow the same. You know, you could watch this back to back with Glory and it makes sense. You could watch this back to back with uh, Braveheart and it would make sense. And I just... I don't know, man. Maybe it's because I'm a child of the 90s. I have a huge soft spot for this specific subgenre of movie. So you bring up Edward Zick. Edward Zwick made me do a real quick fact check. Uh, the Last Samurai is in the two and a half hour realm. Glory is just over two hours, 122 minutes. So it doesn't quite fit the mold, but it's it's pretty close. <laughs> not not quite as as compact as the Michael Mann classic here. I get. Hey, Brad, let me let me ask you this. You know, mm -hmm. we've been talking about this for a while now, and I keep mentioning that I don't I don't know enough about like film stock to speak intelligently about this. But oh, that, I, I totally do. Oh, I know you do. Right. <laughs> but that movies like Braveheart and movies from the early to mid 90s have this very kind of flat look to them. And it, it just looks so much different than the high contrast stuff we start getting in the late 90s with like Michael Bay and even watching this movie a week after we watched heat, like mm -hmm. the visuals in heat. And I'm not just saying like, because it's set in the modern day. Right. But just the, the stylistic choices of how he films heat looks so much more similar to what we get in, in 2023 than what this movie was. It feels like these two films are, you know, a decade apart and not three years apart. 
I don't know if you like, did you pick up on that as well visually? Yeah, I, I think that for me, I just kept seeing Braveheart because mm-hmm. that's probably the historical, you know, action drama that I'm most familiar with. Like from the from the the theme songs in the movie to the visuals, it it just reminded me a lot of Braveheart. And we talked about that in our Braveheart episode that there's just kind of a flat look to the colors in the movie that, as you said, it's unique to the era and the and the genre. And I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I think it's just something that you once you've seen enough movies in this era, you you can immediately pick it out from like anything else. Yeah. You know, we came into this Michael Mann miniseries and Brad, you hadn't seen any of his films and I had seen the first two that we did, but I was a little bit of a Michael Mann skeptic and rewatching Heat, I think doing Heat a second time really made me a Michael Mann fan. Heat didn't work for me the way it did for some people the first time I saw it. And now watching it a second time, I'm like, oh, this is a masterpiece. And then I watched this movie and it feels so far out of the wheelhouse that we've kind of created for ourselves, which is urban sprawl and high level crime that <laughs> that I don't know exactly how to fit it into his filmography. And it reminds me a lot of the struggles that people have when they try to pigeonhole someone like Scorsese, which is gangster movie. And then you watch a movie like Kundun or Silence and you have to take a step back and examine the themes that he's working with if you're really trying to apply sort of auteur things to him. Well, see, Bob, if you if you look at the Japanese government in silence like the mob, <laughs> that, then it really starts to actually make sense. <laughs> well, I guess what I'm saying here is this. I do still see a lot of the fingerprints of Michael Mann on this movie because it is so much about codes and honoring codes and disrespecting codes the way that we had in movies like Heat. And I think there's there's something there. But Daniel, I mean, you're, you're the expert on this movie. How do you see this fitting into man's filmography? Well, th- the short answer, I guess, is that Michael Mann has honestly never seemed to me a filmmaker who cares much about themes. Hmm. I have always felt like he's a filmmaker who cares predominantly about what is interesting to him visually. And he'll, you know, story hunt or adapt a film purely around that. And it's true that a lot of his films end up involved with or end up about, you know, uh, crime stories in some way or another. But I don't think that's because he's interested in, in, you know, good or bad or uh, criminal punishment or anything like that in terms of themes. I think it's it's just about the way he wants to portray action. Hmm. I was going to say, it seems to me like man is very interested in how crime creates high tension situations. Yeah, like he, like he would never direct like 500 days of summer, you know, just about a normal <laughs> relationship and how it affects this guy's life. Like he, I, it doesn't seem like man would be interested in a story like that. He wants to put his characters into really high pressure situations and kind of see what comes out of them. Is, is that fair? Yeah, I think for the most part, that's fair. And I mean, you know, like you said, with high pressure situations, I think you can even fit uh, Ali and the insider. The insider. Yeah, for sure. All right. So I want to press you a little bit on man then, because I I'm still like I, I tipped into being a man fan and now I'm back into being a man agnostic a little bit because, you know, I mentioned <laughs> Edward Zwick a little bit earlier. And as I watched this film, I thought to myself, what is man doing here visually that an Edward Zwick wouldn't do? And, you know, I don't mean to pit the two of them against each other, but in a lot of ways, this did feel like your kind of standard studio historical epic from the the early to mid 90s. And so when you look at this film in particular, like, what do you think man brings to the table visually that other directors couldn't or wouldn't do? So when I think about The Last of the Mohicans, I, I, I do love the whole movie. I don't want to minimize that. But I almost feel like I have to specify that I'm really mostly talking about the last half hour. That I think the last half hour is about as perfect as filmmaking gets. Hmm. And then to even zoom more hyper specifically, the last 10 minutes. And the last 10 minutes is what I think of as pure cinema. There is no dialogue in the last 10 Mm -hmm. minutes except for the final coda where they're, you know, um, standing at the cliff and talking about being the quote unquote last of the weekends. But before that, the final 10 minutes, 
is three things. It is music, it is imagery, and it is editing. And there is no dialogue at all. Hmm. And so when you ask about what man brings to this story, that's what, or, you know, that, that San Edward Zwick doesn't, that's what it is, is that for man, this story is all about how I can tell this story with a camera. And Edward Zwick, I think, is much more interested in kind of educating audiences and also kind of moralizing to audiences, Mm -hmm. which isn't to say that he's not good at the visual elements of film. I mean, I like a lot of Edward Zwick movies, but he has an agenda that goes beyond filmmaking, I would say, whereas Michael Mann really doesn't. For for Mann, I think it's the filmmaking is the be all end all. For the lesser cinephiles out there, can you give me some Edward Zwick movies that, that would be common knowledge to the public? Yeah, the the most famous ones are probably going to be Glory, uh, Blood Diamond, The Last Samurai. Uh, oh, okay, Legends okay. He made some bangers. I re- I really yeah. wish that that Hollywood was still like utilizing him to his full extent. Although yeah. I guess I'm glad that he's avoided like making a superhero movie because that's <laughs> it, it seems like that's the last stand now is like don't don't sell out to Marvel. Yeah, you know he was really good at just making. My budget historical crowd pleasers, which is kind of a niche in, on, in, you know, into itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And something that we don't really do anymore. Yeah. It feels like th- those would make tons of money in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> just like just like the woman king in Babylon did. Mm hmm. Exactly. Brad, seriously, I think by the time this episode comes out, the woman king is going to be streaming on Netflix. And okay. I've been telling you like all year. The, the great thing about The Woman King is that it has the feel of an early 90s historical epic. Like, yeah, it doesn't feel like a movie that's being made in 2023. And take that for I mean, you know, I'm not trying to insinuate anything about that other than it just has that rousing classic Hollywood structure and looseness and humor. And like, I couldn't believe as I was sitting in the theater watching that movie that it was coming out now and that it wasn't something from 30 years ago that I just happened to stumble upon. It's I so really good. Agree. I really, really like The Woman King. It's in my top 10 of the year. And when I saw it in Toronto, you know, I even tweeted like it feels reductive somehow to compare it to Gladiator and Braveheart. But those really are the most apt comparisons because they are movies that don't exist anymore. And then all of a sudden here is one. Yeah. hundred hmm. percent. Well, I mean, I wasn't sold before, but Daniel, hearing you say that, <laughs> I I've, I've suddenly feel the urge to go watch The Woman King. It's really, really good. <laughs> you are just well, the I, worst, man. I will take your word for it, Daniel. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. All right, let's talk about the performances in this movie. There's a few that I want to hone in on, but, you know, the most obvious one is Daniel Day-Lewis. Brad, this is, I think, the only only the second Daniel Day-Lewis film we've had on the show thus far. We haven't Mm -hmm. gotten around to, uh, you know, Phantom Thread, but we've done There Will Be Blood, and now there's this one. And so it's a very, very weird dichotomy of Daniel Day Lewis films because there will be blood is a movie that is built around the Daniel Day Lewis performance. Like Mm -hmm. as much as I love that movie, there are very few filmmakers who are willing to just kind of like let their scenes go on for a too long amount of time because the actor is just cooking. And that's what Day Lewis is doing in that movie. And that's not the case here. And I feel like to be quite frank, I really like Daniel Day-Lewis in this movie, but because it is such a conventional Hollywood historical drama, I don't know that like anything about the performance really stands out in a kind of like transcendent way for me here. Yeah, I I will say for some reason, I I don't know why, I was under the impression that he won the Academy Award for Best Actor for this performance. Oh, interesting. Like, Like I knew that he had won a few throughout his career. But I really genuinely thought he had won it for The Last of the Mohicans. And so, like, I was getting near the end of the movie and I was like, man, like, this is a good performance. <laughs> you know, it's nothing to sneeze at. But I don't know if it's a 
Oscar worthy performance, you know, especially with There Will Be Blood being the <laughs> the other example of Daniel Day Lewis I had in my head. So I think there are two interesting points to to pick up on there. One is that this movie actually was almost completely ignored by the Oscars. I think it won Best Sound, but yeah. it's also its only nomination. Yep, hmm. you are so, right there. You know, the, and the even weird, weirder thing about that is that Last of the Mohicans was a box office hit. You know, a lot of times with films like this, you can point to why the Oscars ignored them as like, well, audiences kind of rejected it. And so, you know, Academy members just never saw it. This one, it was a hit and Oscar voters ignored it anyway. So that's a weird thing in and of itself. But then the other thing to pick up on there is that uh, so Daniel Day Lewis did not win an Oscar for this movie. He won for My Left Foot, which was 1989. Mm -hmm. But this was his first movie after that, even though it was three years later. And it's fascinating to me to see Daniel Day Lewis in the 80s in films like My Left Foot and uh, My Beautiful Andrette yep. and um, uh, Room with a View is this very sort of proper English actor doing very staid domestic period dramas. And then all of a sudden here he is in, in a Hollywood action blockbuster. And so it not only amazes me that this was his very next film and this is his first Hollywood film and his first American film, his first action movie, but that Michael Mann saw something in his, in his 80s work that made him think this is, you know, somehow Michael Mann watched my left foot and thought, this is this is the guy for last movie. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to actually think that Daniel Day Lewis has like precognitive abilities and he knew he was going to get this role. So he was just like living in the forest where Michael <laughs> Mann went to scout for the movie. And he just stumbled upon Daniel Day-Lewis already <laughs> okay. being Nathaniel Day. So it's hilarious that you said that because I watched the director's commentary on Last of the for the first time today just to see if you know I was going to pick up any. I've seen the movie a million times, but I don't think I'd ever watched the director's commentary. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if I picked up anything extra. And, oh, I'm sorry. This wasn't even the director's commentary. This was in the making of on the Blu-ray. There's an interview with Daniel Day-Lewis on the making of where he says that the reason he took the role is because of the way Michael Mann – pitch to him the idea of people living in the forest and living off the land. <laughs> and <laughs> that was literally what appealed to Daniel Day-Lewis about wanting to, you know, enter that world and do this film with Michael Mann. Speaking of entering a world, I want you guys to enter an alternate reality with me just for a moment here where it's, it's kind of too bad. You know, a lot of times people win an Oscar and then they go make their big action blockbuster after the fact. Cause it's like, all right, I, you know, I, I labored away trying to win this thing. Now I want to go have some fun. But uh, we were only a few years away from like if Day Lewis wins his Oscar in in 92 and then takes three years off, we could have plausibly had him come back with an action blockbuster directed by Michael Bay. Ooh. And I am I am so sad <laughs> that we never got the Day Lewis Bay pairing. Like The Rock could have been Day Lewis and not Nicolas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been something easily. It could have been Daniel Day Lewis that gets the Sean Connery lecture about fing the prom queen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have done it with such gravitas. Like, that's his Oscars clip right there. Oh, All right, Brad. Uh, I guess let's go ahead and talk about Madeline Stowe in this movie, who is somebody, you know, uh, to, to borrow shamelessly from a podcast that we've already mentioned on here is an actress that really got swallowed up by the mid to late 90s and and we can say got market corrected by a couple other actresses. But truly, I mean, she had a moment there and then was pretty much gone. And, you know, Daniel, you're a few years older than we are, so I'm, I'm sure that you maybe followed her career a little bit more closely than we did. But, I mean, in your opinion, like, what happened to Madeline Stowe? The the short answer is I have no idea. I, I think of her <laughs> and Julia Ormond in in the same kind of category is is these beautiful brunette actresses that have this sort of classical range to them mm -hmm. that were in a a pretty good number of major huge Hollywood movies in the early to mid nineties and then just disappeared off the face of the earth. And you know I I, I don't know the answer, so I don't want to pretend as though I I do. But with a lot of these actresses, I think sometimes the cases they didn't want it, that they that they, you know, wanted to raise a family instead. You know, that's definitely what happened to Bridget Fonda. And she said as much. Yeah. Um, but whether or not that's the case with what happened to Madeline Stowe, I have no idea. But, you know, another one of my favorite movies from the era is 12 Monkeys, which she was also fantastic. In. Yeah. 
I do think that you can never underestimate the Julia Roberts atomic bomb that went off in Hollywood in the 90s yeah. and how I mean, you you hit the nail on the head. There was just like a plethora of brunette leading women. And, you know, she's one of them. And I think very like her face very structurally reminds me a lot of Juliette Binoche as well. And so I think there may have been yeah. some confusion. Uh, you know, I, I think she looks a lot like Andy McDowell. Like there were just so many people competing for these roles. And then all of a sudden, Julia Roberts upends all that. And now there's no more rules because everybody wants like this redhead who's, you know, doing a completely different thing. It's just really interesting to me to see people throughout, you know, Hollywood history who had such a good career. And then they just happened to run up against the 2017 warriors of <laughs> of actresses or <laughs> actors. And it just seems like the whole climate of Hollywood changes and, and the rug gets pulled out from under them a little bit. Yeah. You know, there, I was listening to a Hollywood Reporter podcast interview with Michelle Pfeiffer a while back, and there was a part where in the interview where they just said, you know, I've seen your name attached to a lot of roles that you allegedly turned down. Can we just go through some of them? And the, the interviewer listed off probably 15 movies in a row. Just were you offered that one? And she says, yep, that one. Yep. And it was it was everything from that era. It was it was Pretty Woman. It was Thelma and Louise. It, you know, every major lead female role from that era. And Silence of the Lambs in a movie that remember. Michelle Pfeiffer turned down before it went to someone else. Hmm. All right, Brad, what did you think of Madeline Stowe in this movie? I thought she was really great. I, I think that she has a gravitas. She has like a, a solidness to her character and the way she portrays her character that like really draws you in. And I think that one of the most important things for me with any romance in a movie is that I it has to be believable that the two people would fall for each other. And I, I think that with Daniel Day Lewis playing this man caught in between two worlds, extremely serious, you know, motivated person, you have to have a similar character opposite of him. And I think that Madeline Stowe really does a great job with that. You know, you, you couldn't just have. Oh, I don't know, like like one of the the younger sisters from Pride and Prejudice, you know, some young British girl who's just completely silly about her life. Like you needed somebody who's a little bit older, a little more mature. And I thought she did really, really great with that. Yeah, I love her in the role. Um, and more importantly, I think she and Daniel Day Lewis just have fantastic chemistry in the movie. I mean, yeah. you know, the 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 seduction scene where he famously she asks him what he's looking at. And he says, I'm looking at you, miss. Just the way they look at each other, you know, that's you can't you can't manufacture that kind of chemistry. Mm -mm. It makes you it makes you wonder, like what uh, Day Lewis was up to with his method acting. Like, <laughs> did, he, did he just actually fall head over heels in love for her, like as part of the role? Well, let me tell you something about his method acting that I learned in the making of is that he really did learn how to run and load two muskets at the same time. That's incredible. If she didn't fall in love with him after that, then <laughs> I don't I don't I don't know what else he could do. <laughs> you know, this is so funny, Brad. Usually we don't talk about people's like physical looks on the show. It's just uh, something that's not usually apropos to what we're talking say, about. Sylvester Stallone with a beard. I was going to say over the last <laughs> few weeks, the attractiveness of male leads has come up repeatedly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, last week we said De Niro in Heat might be peak attractive De Niro. I'm, I don't know, man. Uh, this might be peak attractive day Lewis. Oh, 100 percent. I, I, I don't even know what else would be a competitor. <laughs> I mean, I think I, if his... you wanted to go like the salt and pepper look, you could you could offer up Phantom Thread, but it's a completely different look. Yeah. You know, and to say a little bit more about the chemistry between uh, Daniel Day Lewis and Madeline Stone, the film, the the scene under the waterfall where Daniel Day Lewis gives the famous, you know, no matter how far, no matter, you know, I'll I'll find you no matter how long, like. That is one of the corniest scenes in movie history, but it works here because you actually believe in that set of emotions between these two characters mm -hmm. and you replace it with any other actors. And that becomes one of the most laughable scenes in film history. But with these two, because of what they brought to the film up to that point, the movie gets away with it. Yeah. Bob, you and I have talked a lot about how there's not really any young, you know, superstar talent in the acting world right now. And I like I really think about, you know, what if you threw a Chris Evans in that role or uh, a Michael B. Jordan or, or something like that, where I'm like, I just 
don't see them being able to, you know, if I, I'm guessing that Daniel Day Lewis was in his mid 30s when he had this role. Yeah, they're, thereabouts. Yeah, I don't see them in their mid 30s being able to pull off that line and that scene in the way that Day Lewis does. Because you're right, Daniel, he he knocks it out of the park. Now, if there is somebody in this cast that I think actually steals the whole damn movie, it's Wes Studi as Magua. He is fantastic. Like, 100%. Talk about the kind of performance that should have been nominated for an Oscar. As much as I love DDL, like the best performance in this movie is is him as the villain. Yeah, he's an incredible villain. It should not go unsaid that he speaks, I think, three different languages in the film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Wes Studi did actually get an honorary Oscar a few years back for being one of the great Native American actors. Yeah, I and mean, well-deserved, man. And, and it's just, you know, again, it's it's too bad that it couldn't be recognized in the moment because... It sounds like we're all in agreement here. He's the best performance in the film for me. Easily. Yeah, he he brings a tenacity to that role that you just don't often see in villains. And I, I loved it, man. And while we're talking about the Native American actors in the film, we should mention, I just found out that uh, the actor who plays Daniel day Lewis's adoptive father, the Mohican Chinga Chuk in the film, is uh, his name is Russell Means. And this is his first movie. He was actually one of the main characters in the Wounded Knee standoff against the FBI in 1973. And Michael Mann sought him out to put him in the movie for that reason. Wow. Man, talk about a great debut. Yeah. Holy like he cow. didn't even kick around on the indie scene for any, any amount of time. It's just straight yeah. into Last of the Mohicans. Yeah. And <laughs> Michael Mann said in the commentary that, you know, Russell Means was in his mid 50s at the time. Mann had sought him out uh, because he thought, you know, in making a film about Native Americans, it would be beautiful if the, you know, one of the public's main imagery of Native Americans was in the film. And so he was in his mid 50s and he was out of shape, as most people in their mid 50s are, the way Michael Mann put it. But it only took him about three weeks to get completely ready for the film. Holy cow. I guess when you hang around with Day Lewis living in the forest, like, <laughs> exactly. it just whips you into shape, man. <laughs> All right. Before we go to break, guys, is there anybody else from the cast that you want to call out for their performances? Uh, there are a lot of um, actors in the film who have smaller parts that people might not realize are there and know from elsewhere. The actor who played uh, Price in Mad Men um, is one of the British soldiers. Oh, earlier. yeah. What is his name? Price. We'll just call him Price. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. Uh, and, Pete, uh, Pete Postlethwaite shows up for a hot yeah, second. Yeah, Pete Postlethwaite is in the film. Uh, sorry, I'm going to look up this actor's name real fast. And also the actress who plays uh, Madeline Stowe's younger sister in the film, Cora. Mm-hmm. Um, she, Jody May. Jody May. Yeah, she was um, in Game of Thrones. She was Maggie the Frog, who gives the um, prophecies to Cersei that her kids will all die. Huh. Oh, that's cool. I love when people like kind of kick around in the same genres for most of their career. Like Brad, the guy in Braveheart with the scars on his face. Mm-hmm. Every time he was in a movie after that, it was like, yep, you see that guy in a movie and you're like, I know exactly what kind of movie this is going to be now. <laughs> like, I just love it when you can find an actor and when you see them show up in a movie, you immediately know like what trajectory the movie is going to go on. Bob Book, huge fan of typecasting. <laughs> oh, Jared Harris is the British actor's name who is uh, Price in Mad Men. And he was also the star of um, <laughs> the HBO miniseries about the reactor explosion. Oh, now, Chernobyl. Yeah. Chernobyl. Yes. He was the star of Chernobyl. Oh, man. <laughs> well, Brad, on that note, I think it's time for us to hit pause. We're going to try this Glenn Livet enigma. But before we get into that, our friends at Detroit City Distillery have hooked Daniel up with some samples. So, unfortunately, you know, the U.S. mail being what it is, we could not send Daniel a sample of the Enigma that we're tasting today. But we have some good connections in the Michigan area. And I think they made a like a home delivery to Daniel to drop off some samples. And I'd love to get your thoughts on them, Daniel, before we go to break here. Uh, they did. I unfortunately have not tasted them yet. But in addition to the samples, they gave us a, a pass for a tour of the distillery of the Two James Distillery in Detroit that my wife and I are very excited to go on. Oh, nice. We tried we tried all three of those, I think, earlier in the season. And there's one. It's a vermouth finished rye. Phenomenal. Yeah. Like just yeah. so, so good. And so how do you recommend drinking that? As fast as possible. <laughs> 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 no, I think it, honestly, it's it, it'll be really good over a big rock. It's good. And neat. You know, it's like it's pretty high proof, as I remember, Brad. I think it was like one hundred and fifteen proof or something. But yep. um, yeah. Man, it was darn good. 
Yeah, honestly, Daniel, I am really excited for you to get up to Detroit City Distillery. That, that'll be a blast for you guys. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. All right, Brad, let's jump into this Glen Livet. What do you say? Let's get to it. Hey there, you poppin' jays, it's me, George B. Stagger, your trusted voice in the world of selective spirits. Today's 60-second whiskey appraisal is brought to you by Doc Swinson's. Doc Swinson's, the perfect whiskey for adventurous whiskey explorers. Today, we're reviewing their Trace Amigos, one of their exploratory cask series. This is a straight rye whiskey finished in rum and tequila barrels. On the nose, it's all orange to me, friends. Citrus fruit and agave with just a hint of pear. The palate is a mean mix of toasted sugar, peppercorn, and citrus. And the finish is just bursting full of pineapple, vanilla, and oak. By golly, this whiskey is bonkers delicious. If you are in the market for a grand old time, then you must go partake in the delicious offerings prepared by the legendary blenders over at Doc Swinson's. Remember, this 60-second review has been brought to you by Doc Swinson's. Find the closest retailer to you at docswhiskey.com. That's D-O-C-S whiskey.com. Until next time, folks, this is George B. Stagger signing off. All right, so today we are checking out the Glenlivet Enigma. Brad, this is a special release whiskey from the Glenlivet Distillery. It is part of a series that they call the Mystery Series, where they put out a whiskey with absolutely no information about it. Like, they ha- they, legally, they have to put the ABV on the packaging, so we know that this is a very high-proof scotch. But they don't release any tasting notes. They don't release any of the information about the barrel or how long it's been aged. Like, it's it's kind of cool. It's like a little game. And then later on in the year of that special release, they they uh, ostensibly released that information to the public so they can play along. This was the fourth one in that series. It came out in 2019. So it's like, you know, it was a one-off release. You might still find some on the shelf. Brad, I think I picked this up in the uh, Ohio Liquor Last Call section because, you know, it's a limited release, so they had to get it off their books. And so we've been holding on to it for a while. I wanted to try to pair it up with the movie A Beautiful Mind because we've been talking about doing that one for a while. And then when that didn't make it onto this year's list of movies, I was just like, screw it. Like, we need to we need to drink it <laughs> before it's been available for five years, right? So uh, we're yeah. pairing it up with Last of the Mohicans, and uh, we'll have to find some clever way of linking the two. But that's what we're drinking today. I was going to say, if it's if all of them are based on mysteries, do they, like, send you a deerstalker hat to go with it? <laughs> they should. Here's the funny thing about this one, though, Brad. I can find information about all of their other mystery releases, but it doesn't look like they ever actually released the info on Enigma. Truly, truly an Enigma. Yeah. Enigma yeah. I mean, I guess maybe, you know, it was late 2019, so maybe they were really worried about uh, this new pandemic thing that was about to go around the world. But, like... <laughs> I just can't believe like it looks like they finally posted some tasting notes, but then they actually incorrectly labeled them as belonging to a different bottle in this mystery series. So I don't know if they're even really the right tasting notes. So we're really going into this blind and I'm kind of happy about that. What you're saying is that the only tasting notes people really need is ours. That's right. So you have had this already. I have not. Like I said, this is clocking in. At a pretty staggering, let's see, what's it at? 60.6% ABV or 121.2 proof, making this, I believe, the highest proof scotch whiskey we've ever had on the show. Yeah, I was going to say, is it Ardbeg that has a a barrel proof scotch that we had? Yeah, Laphroaig has one too, but I don't think we've tried their cask strength version. We have with the Ardbeg, uh, oh, which one was that? Uh, Ugadol. Ugadol? Yeah, Ugadol was delicious. Yeah, I honestly, after having this one, I think that more scotches need to be made at at cask strength because they're delicious, Bob. They're really, really good. I am swirling this around in my glass right now, Brad, and I have to say the color on this is really interesting. It's a little bit more like caramely in color than you'd normally get with a scotch, and it almost has like a reddish hue to it. It's like a strawberry blonde kind of (laughs) kind of whiskey. I'm digging it so far, man, but let's go ahead and jump into our nosing notes. I'm going to stick my nose in this glass while you uh, regale us with yours. Yeah, this one has an incredible nose. I got a little bit of honey at the start, and then there's some charcuterie, there's some vanilla, and then a, a little hint of a herbal, almost like a watercress. 
It, it has such a fascinating nose here that I really, really like. I will give it an eight and a half. I'm going to just stick at a seven and a half on this. And the only reason for that is I'm picking up pretty much everything that you're laying down here. But the first thing that jumped out to me is that this almost reminds me of like a younger rye or a younger bourbon. There's some yeastiness on this that I don't typically get on Irish or Scotch whiskeys. And it's kind of the first time I've ever really experienced this on a scotch. So I have to imagine that that's intentional and that this is not just a really young scotch because, Brad, we've had really young malt whiskeys before. They don't smell yeasty. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So this smells like a very, very bready. And that's kind of the predominant note here for me. I like it, but my past experience with things that smell like yeast is not great. So I'm going to give it a seven and a half. Well, I am going to move on to the uh, palate here. On the taste, I think that you get some mint right off the front end. There's that honey coming through. Vegetal hits the mid palate. And then there's a little bit of caramel mixed with almost like a peppery white pepper feel as well. I think that this is an incredible tasting scotch, Bob. Wow, this Uh, is is beautiful. Yeah, I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 on the palate. Yeah, man, this... um... Wow. It's got the sweet and light and bright notes of an Irish whiskey on the front, um, but with even more sweetness. This is like almost Mm -hmm. bourbon sweet on the front. It hits the mid palate and then it really opens up. And it kind of reminds me uh, just like experientially of that Glenmorangie, a star we had last week where it was pretty tame on the front. And then once it hit the mid palate, it was like, hey, here's that alcohol. It's very tingly on the tongue. It doesn't really hit you as much on the finish or on like the the sort of chest burn on the way down, but it also doesn't drink like 120 proof. It brings those great kind of herbal, almost bitter notes of a of a smoky scotch on the back. Like, and this is not peaty, but it mm-hmm. has that great sort of smokiness we've come to expect just in terms of like how it delivers that char level. This is a beautiful scotch, man. It's soft where it needs to be soft. It packs a punch where it needs to pack a punch. I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10 on the flavor. Yeah, I like I said before, there needs to be more cast strength uh, scotches out there, people. Uh, the finish here comes off a little bit from the palate. Uh, th- there's some oak, some tobacco, and then it, it kind of took on a little bit of a cherry cordial flavor at the end. A little bit creamy that I liked. Um, I'll give it an 8 out of 10 on the finish. You know what it kind of reminds me of on the finish is like the nose and the initial tasting notes of like a Willet bourbon product. It's got that sort of like rosy, but also cherry flavor, but it's mingled with that sort of like cigarette ash thing you get on scotch. It's a really interesting, it doesn't quite get medicinal, but it's kind of teetering on the edge there. I like it because it still stays pretty sweet, but I do think it is a step down from the palate a little bit. I'm going to give it an eight out of 10. Yeah, and then we get into balance. Uh, I I actually think that this is one of the best balanced whiskeys we've had in a little while. You know, I, I my scores for nose and finish were a little below the taste, but I think this is a really complex whiskey that has a lot of interesting flavors working together beautifully. I'm going to give it a nine and a half on balance. Wow. Yeah, I don't know if it's quite that well balanced for me just because the nose didn't give away how complex and how much of a journey it would be on the palate and on the finish. It was kind of a dull nose by comparison. And that's going to ding me just a little bit, but I'm going to come out to an eight and a half on the balance. Yeah. And then that takes us into our uh, value category. Now, obviously, you're not able to purchase this uh, you know, from retailers anymore as it's been out for a few years. But the best I can find is that currently you could find it online for $150. I've seen a couple online stores offering it for about 110. Uh, and again, I, I'm not factoring in the shipping on that. So I have no idea after shipping how much this would cost you. When I picked this up off the shelf in Ohio, it was at $100. And I think that's a fantastic value for this, Brad. Mm-hmm. I, I'll get into my score on what the market currently is. But for a barrel proof scotch whiskey, that is like, let's be frank here. It's part of a gimmick. And I have no idea how old this actually ended up being, but I have to imagine that this is, you know, at the very least, what, six, eight years old, Brad? Like, scotch is not normally sold at under that age point. So, I mean, I think $100 is a pretty darn good value for what you're getting here. 
at 110, 120, 130, I have to factor that in a little bit, but I still think, Brad, that this is like at least an eight out of 10 on value. Yeah, I think at a, well, yeah, I think if we're talking 110, 120, I'm with you at an eight out of 10. I did do my value at $150, which I would I would give it a seven out of 10. So I'll stick at a seven out of 10. I think it's a little bit high at 150, but still a really good value. But it, mm-hmm. yeah, you're right. If this was $100, this would be like a nine, nine and a half out of 10 value. I mean, I'm really glad we held off on this one till the last episode of the season. This feels like it feels like a special occasion whiskey. I'm not necessarily saying that it is, and it's certainly not in that sort of rarefied air of some of these allocated bottles we've tried before. But because it is a special release, it's it's hard to get your hands on now. And then when you factor in the proof point and just how complex the flavor is, man, if you can find a bottle of Glenlivet Enigma, I would highly recommend trying yeah. it or buying it. Yeah, 100%. This is a whiskey that would be awesome to have on your shelf. Also, if you haven't seen it before, please Google an image of it because it is a killer bottle. Yeah, the packaging is awesome on this, man. Brad, I'm coming out to a 41 out of 50. What are you coming out to? I'm at a 42 out of 50, Bob. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're at a 41.5 on average or an 83 out of 100. And you did that math so fast. Dude, I'm so good at this. (laughs) <laughs> this is pretty much a no-brainer recommendation, I think. Yeah, easy, easy recommend. If you see it at the bar, get a pour. If you are able to get a bottle, definitely buy it. All right, Brad. Well, that was pretty painless and, dare I say, enjoyable. Let's get back into talking about Last of the Mohicans. What do you say? Let's get to it. All right, everybody. That was Glen Livid Enigma, a whiskey that I, at the very least, thought was truly incredible. Mm, a, a true enigma. A true enigma. You know, it isn't a true enigma. How terrible you are at two facts and a falsehood. Two facts and a falsehood. Every time I'm given a glimmer of hope that I will finish above 500 on this season. <laughs> the door just slams shut. I mean, it slams shut. You got me again last week with heat. You, I, I, as I recall, last week you crafted some pretty good ones. Yeah. Well, I only craft one. That's well, that's the, true. That's the, true. The internet crafts the other two. <laughs> <laughs> How long till you start using like Chat GPT to start making these these questions? Who's to say that I haven't been using it all along? It's, it's all been an AI simulation. I'm an AI simulation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. <laughs> So uh, for those who are uninitiated, two facts and a falsehood is exactly what it sounds like. Brad pulls a couple facts, facts in quotation marks, off of the internet about the making of this movie. He adds one of his own falsehoods to the mix, and I have to try to parse out which ones are true and which one is the falsehood. Brad, go ahead and hit me with your two facts and a falsehood. All righty. Fact number one. Colonel Monroe here is a heavily fictionalized version of his real life counterpart. The real Colonel Monroe never married, had no children. He survived the massacre of his men and reached Albany only to die three months later of an epileptic seizure. Mm, That's what you get. Fact number two, the story told by Nathaniel when they are hiding from the Huron War Party was based on the poem Stargazer, written by famous Native American poet Chrysosto Apache. Fact number three, as a personally, as a big Star Wars fan myself, I couldn't help but notice that the Wilhelm scream was inserted about an hour and a half into the movie, right when Daniel Day-Lewis bludgeons an enemy in the face. Oh, man. What was inserted half hour into the earth? Uh, the Wilhelm scream. Uh-huh. Are you familiar? I don't think I am. It's a, it's a sound effect. That is in like hundreds and hundreds of movies. And it's the sound effect of the guy just going like, and like when he falls off of something, it's like a howl. It's in hundreds of films. Yeah. I believe the very first use of it, though, was in 1977's Star Wars. Was it really? I thought it was from like the 30s, like King Kong or something. Oh, I I might just be a Star Wars stan and. Huh. assume that everything came out of Star Wars, but I thought it came from Star Wars. Well, well, we'll fact check that, but I have to fact check two other things first here. So, man, here's the thing, Brad, sometimes you come up with very innocuous sounding facts, like none of these sounded spicy or sexy at all. 
So I just assume that they're all true because they're kind of boring. Yeah, you're not going to get much help from me on this because I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, My man. sense is that the first one sounded too well researched to be made up. But beyond that, I have no clue. Number two, I also just kind of feel like, OK, I, like it doesn't add anything to the enjoyment of the film. So it just kind of seems like, all right, cool. Maybe there's a well, maybe there's a poem. I didn't know that my job was to add to your enjoyment <laughs> of the film, Bob. I'm just going to go ahead and say number three is the falsehood and that you didn't have anything on your mind to think about except for Star Wars. So you just made up the Star <laughs> Wars one. Bob, that is not true uh, because the fact is true. Uh, the Wilhelm scream is in the film at the hour. I think it's hour 38 minutes. It's somewhere in the like right around an hour and a half. Now, did you notice that yourself or was that on IMDb somewhere? It was on IMDb, and then I went back to that that area and heard it. Okay, okay. It, it's not quite as clear as it is in the Star Wars films, but it is there. Okay. Uh, fact number two was the falsehood. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, Stargazer. Although I did do research, uh, Christoso Apache is a famous Native American poet. Well, there you go. Man. So. You, you got me again. Nailed it. I'm ending the season on such a downer here. I'm ending the season on a great, <laughs> great upswing. So I, I'm not complaining, Bob. All right. Well, let's steer out of that because that was just uh, brutal. And let's start talking about this movie some more. And Daniel, I think the thing that I really want to key in on here is I love the fact that you are just like you came on the podcast. You're like, it's my favorite movie ever. And then uh, and then immediately said, honestly, though, it's the last half hour. And I'm really glad you said that because right before you hopped on the call with us tonight, Brad and I were talking about how, you know, this movie really felt a little bit not dated, but just kind of slow and and a little bit uh, stayed in the first hour or so. And then that last 40 something minutes was like a breath of fresh air. And I want to go yeah. in a little bit on that. I mean, you've, you've talked about the cinematic technique of the last 10 minutes, but I really think it bears repeating here because it, it is so similar to our experience with Heat last week. I think man just really knows how to end a film. Yeah. So I basically think of the film is there's the whole film, there's the last 40 minutes, and there's the last 10 minutes. The whole film, I give a B plus. Mm. The last 40 minutes, I give an A. And the last 10 minutes, I give an A plus, plus, plus. <laughs> I love that. Brad, can you think of any other movies that you feel that way about? Like, all right, if you just crop out this segment of the movie, it's a 10 out of 10, but the rest of it's like an eight. Honestly, I, we can jump back into Star Wars for a second. I think that the endings of both Revenge of the Sith and Return of the Jedi are flat out incredible. You know, like when we when we did Return of the Jedi, I said the final battle scene from, you know, about the last 40 minutes of the movie I think it's just some of the greatest action sequences of all time. Uh, I think the same thing about Revenge of the Sith. The last like 30, 40 minutes of that movie are impeccable. The first halves of both those movies, a as, a, as a massive Star Wars fan, are really not good movies. <laughs> <laughs> They're just not great. And, I, and, and that doesn't detract from my enjoyment of them. But I'm with you in that like if you honed in – it's almost like you're taking a telescope and you're looking at, you know, the whole forest and then you zoom in onto a little bit of it and you're like, oh, wow, that's really beautiful there. And then you hone in even further, like you said, the last 10 minutes and you're like, oh, wow, there's some great stuff going on here. Yeah, I'm reminded of the Howard Hawks famous quote of that the key to a great film is no bad is three good scenes and no bad scenes. And like last night is like no bad scenes, and then the last, the best half hour you're ever going to see in your life. <laughs> I was uh, on Twitter today, as I am wont to do, and uh, I saw a clip from The Social Network. And I mean, my spicy take is that I think The Social Network is a really good movie, uh, but it's no Zodiac. <laughs> However, it was the scene towards the end of the movie, like in the last 15 minutes, where Andrew Garfield blows up on him and, and smashes the laptop and tells him, you better lawyer up, asshole. Like, it's such a great sequence. I think you and I saw the same tweet because it was someone talking about how um, the random quote, I'm sorry I wasn't wearing my f you flip flops yeah. was like her favorite lines ever. 
<laughs> and I started thinking about how good the ending of that movie is. Like, I don't know that that movie is really like the uh, the ultimatum on society that people want to make it into. Like, it's a very small and intimate story. But from that moment to, you know, the the final speech that Rashida Jones gives where she says, you're not an ass. You're just trying so hard to be. And then immediately the needle drop of baby, you're a rich man. It is such a great last 15 minutes. Whereas yeah. the rest of the movie is like a B plus to me. I adore the social network. My hot take on why it hasn't survived as well historically is because we no longer think of Facebook as a social network. We now think of it as the network that mm. our parents and aunts and uncles just spread Republican disinformation on. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas if Facebook were still like a big part of our daily lives as a real social network that we use to maintain contact with our friends, then the movie would feel more, it, it, would, yeah. it would retain more power to us. More relevant. Yeah, I like that. Guys, I, I so adore the fact that we have gotten off on so many tangents today. And it's like really making me wonder how we're going to do our next segment, which we call Let's Make It a Double. I'm not going to pair this up with the social network, but Let's Make It a Double is our challenge to ourselves and to our guest to find a movie to pair up with Last of the Mohicans to make the perfect double feature. Brad, do you want to start or should we let our guest start? Yeah, I, I think I actually have a pretty uh, unique pick here. The theme song in this movie obviously has a very brave, hearty, gladiator type of feel to it. But there's moments of it where I was listening to it at the end of the film and I was like, you know, this actually kind of reminds me of like a Western theme song. And there, there was something about that that just clicked in my brain. I'm going to pair this with The Searchers. Oh, interesting. I think that there's enough of a vibe of the man dedicated to find his person no matter what that like connects them as a through line. And I think it'd be a really unique viewing experience. But I think watching The Last of the Mohicans and then going into The Searchers would be a really fascinating uh, movie evening. I think that would be like like I can just see that pairing on a syllabus in like an intro to film class where it. The the point of it is depictions of Native Americans on film because they're <laughs> they're such wildly different. You know, uh, very famously, we we just did the searchers a couple months ago. Like the main villain in that movie is supposed to be a Native American and it's played by a German guy. Like mm -hmm. it, just really rough. That did not age well at all. But I think you're right, Brad. That there are some some themes that they share in common, and they do have that sort of. I don't know. They have that that weightiness to them that these kind of sprawling historical epics have. I like that pairing. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, I'll go next because I don't think that mine is going to be that good this week. Sometimes I come up with really clever ones and I was trying to think of like, oh, maybe if you just want to watch uh, five hours of British soldiers getting shot, like pair it up with RRR. That would be a fantastic double pair. <laughs> right. But <laughs> Uh, I think, honestly, the one that keeps coming back to me is The Last Samurai, which is, again, I think would be an interesting pairing to compare and contrast. The Last Samurai is a movie that has caught a lot of crap over the last decade or so because, you know, it, it gets lumped in as a white savior movie. I think it's a little bit more nuanced than people make it out to be, but they both have that sort of classic Hollywood feel to them. And I think they also share really similar themes Brad, you said it perfectly earlier about a man torn between two worlds. Uh, we haven't talked about the ending of this film yet. I think I will a little bit in my final score. But the way the note that this movie ends on is not quite a downer, but it it makes you think more than any other part of the movie makes you think. And I really love that questions of identity arise towards the end of this film. And it's really similar with The Last Samurai. So that's going to be my pairing. Can I ask a quick question to clarify? Did I miss something where they talked about how like the Mohican tribe had died out? Yeah, that was like right at the beginning. It actually might have been in the title card. Yeah, I, okay. I would say I don't think you missed anything. Um, and again, okay. this goes again to what man's idea of the movie is, is. I don't think he cared that much about teaching people anything. I think he just wanted to make a story that appealed to his visual sense. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, I, I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. So I was like, wait a second. So like Chingak Chuk just announces that he's the last of the Mohicans. And I was kind of like, wait, wait, wait. Like, I know that's the title of the film, 
But but the title is over Daniel Day Lewis, and I thought he was the last of the Mohicans, and I don't remember them saying anything about it. But but if that's not what man was going mm. for, then that's fine. I'm I'm in. <laughs> so something interesting about this film is that in the intro, you guys talked about whether you're familiar with the source material or ever read the book. I don't think Michael Mann's ever read the book either. And I don't say that. And I don't say that as a joke. I think it was intentional. He talked about in the director's commentary that his impetus for making the film is that he loved seeing the 1936 version when he was like five years old. Hmm. And he wanted to basically remake his memory of the 1936 version. So I don't think he cared about the book as source material at all. To him, the source material was the 1936 film. Oh, I love that. I, I just love it when directors completely discard the sort like, you know, all the stories about Scorsese never watching Infernal Affairs before he did The Departed. Like, I don't know if I buy it, but I love that they're just like, nope, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm not even worried about the source material. Yeah. I mean, far be it for me to call Scorsese a liar, but I'm not sure I buy that because when you see the two films, the, the Departed is almost a shot for shot remake. Yeah. So anyway, Last Samurai is my pick, and I think it goes back to what you're saying here too, Brad. Like, not only does it ask these questions of identity, but it also kind of asks the question of like, who is the last samurai? Who is the last of the Mohicans? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, we can make it a triple feature and just bring your favorite Star Wars film into that and and do The Last Jedi as well. Let's have a last uh -huh. series. Daniel, what is uh, your pick for the double feature? So... You know, everything I love about The Last Mohicans is the way the last 10 minutes are structured and the way Michael Mann creates what I think is this absolute perfect fusion between imagery, music, and editing. And dialogue isn't even remotely a part of that. So I tried to think of another movie where the ending is this perfect capture of visuals, music, and editing and doesn't need dialogue. And guess what? I stumbled on another Michael Mann film. So it is Ali, the Will Smith Muhammad Ali biopic from 2001, mm. which is not one of man's most well-regarded films. And there are parts of it that don't work. There are parts of it that come off as a bit of a mess. But when you get to the last 15 minutes of that film, which are the famous rumble in the jungle fights between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, that the last 15 minutes just bang on all cylinders. Mm. And especially you know, there, what's interesting to me about both Ali and, and Last Mohicans is just before the ending, I can point to an exact moment where it's like, OK, this is where it like almost like really starts for me with Last Mohicans. It's right when the music kicks in and they put the guy on the fire and they start walking away from the Indian War Council. Yep. With Ali, it is during the Ali Foreman fight during a timeout between rounds and one of the girls holding the round cards is kind of walking around the ring and she catches a glimpse of Ali and Ali winks at her. And from that moment, the next five minutes are about the best five minutes you'll ever see in your life. And it's a perfect recreation of the ending of the Ali Foreman 1974 fight, seeing only the way Michael Mann can see it. No dialogue, just music ends on the most gorgeous freeze frame you'll ever see. And it gives me goosebumps no matter how many times I watch it. Yeah, I think, Brad, that's one thing we haven't really talked about with man. And it's because there haven't been a lot of needle drops in the movies that we watched. But he really is one of the best when it comes to incorporating existing music into his movies and his sensibility for like what music can do to transport you. And I've, I've been holding off on this because I know that you have never watched anything by man. But, you know, he, he helped create. Miami Vice, the TV show, the famous TV show. There's an mm -hmm. episode of Miami Vice. It's like the second or third episode ever. And there's been this like overarching story arc where they're they're going to try to take down this drug kingpin. And it's the you know, it's these two cops and they are pretty much convinced that they're going to die. And Don Johnson's character is divorced and lonely and brooding and there's Bob, a, I just want you to know that I have goosebumps because I already know what scene you're talking about. It's so. so freaking good, man. And and he pulls over on the side of the road as they're like going to try to take down this drug kingpin. And he calls his wife on a payphone and they have this conversation where he just asks, like, you know, was it real between us? You know, and behind all that, he layers in Phil Collins in the air tonight and then the drums hit. And it's like nothing had ever been like that on TV before or I think since it's like. 
one of the best directed things I've ever seen in my entire life. To your point, Daniel, it's probably the most blissful three minutes I've ever spent like watching anything. It just like it, it really is this kind of like transporting experience. Yeah. And something I love about cinema is the 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 very specific curation of the last shot and knowing exactly, you know, do the do the credits start rolling this second or two seconds later? And I feel like no one is better at that than Michael Mann. Hmm. You know, I, I don't know if you guys have seen his uh, Miami Vice film adaptation with Colin Farrell and Jamie Foxx. But the way that film ends and he uses a Mogwai song to soundtrack the ending and the final shot of, uh, I think it's Colin Farrell walking into the hospital to check on someone and just everything about it is just the perfect ending. Well, I think this has been about the perfect ending to our season six, Brad. That means we only have one thing left to do, and that's to give this movie a final score out of 10. I do feel a little bit better knowing that uh, Daniel kind of thinks of the movie as a whole as a B plus because I'm kind of in the same boat. Like there are moments in this movie that are absolutely transcendent and then taken as a whole. I really do think it kind of belongs in the conversation with a movie like Glory, with a movie like Braveheart. I think, Brad, I'm going to give this movie an eight out of 10. At that hour and 15 minute mark, I was at like a seven. And that was kind of generous, honestly. And then the last 45 minutes happened and I was like, oh, my gosh, this man, Michael Mann, knows how to end a film. Yeah, from the moment from the moment they um, are surrendering the fort and start marching out of the fort. Yeah. From that moment, you're in for one hell of the next 40 minutes. Absolutely. And again, I, you know, I want to talk real briefly about that very last scene because I thought the movie was going to end in a very conventional way. And then they make that that last kind of ambush to get the girls back and it ends tragically. And then you have the reflection point at the end of the movie with uh, Hawkeye and his adoptive father and his his father is saying, like, I am the last of the Mohicans. And then they just share this very long knowing look where it says, and you are not like you're not the last of the Mohicans. Like you might be my adoptive son, but my son is dead and I'm the last one in this lineage. And it really hammers home this idea that Hawkeye is a guy that's caught between two worlds and will never really feel like he belongs in either of them. And it it really deepened the movie and added so much nuance that hadn't been there before. I think that exchange alone kind of bumped this movie up to an eight for me, Brad. Yeah, I I think all of that is fair. I I think for me, I'm going to give it a seven and a half out of 10. There's just a lot of this movie that didn't totally work for me. And for being somebody who's kind of known for a lot of his action scenes, I think the action scenes in this movie let me down a lot. Hmm. At at least some of the bigger set pieces. I I can't tell you how many times I was watching this and you just kind of have this big old shot of the entire battle that lingers a little too long, which I think is another issue I have with man man's action scenes. But you just see like, you know, actors just kind of standing around waiting for somebody to come attack them. and, and, And the choreography of the scenes is not very impactful. And then there's moments where it is really impactful. And, you know, when he kills Magua at the end of the movie, it's it's like brutal and awesome. So I don't want to say he doesn't do any of it good. It's just there's enough moments that for me, I just felt like this was a fine movie. All right, Daniel, are you splitting the difference between us? Or are you going to raise it a little bit here? No, it's a 10. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's 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 okay you guys are sports guys so it's the question of like do you how do you evaluate someone's career do you evaluate the breadth of their career or do you evaluate who they were at their best mm. and for me you know i can understand watching last mohegans and thinking that it doesn't grab you until the last 40 minutes but the way those last 40 minutes grab you just erases all sense yeah i've got a few movies like that where because I was going to say, it sounds like you're talking to yourself right now because the whole podcast up to now, you're like, yeah, it's really just the last 40 minutes. And then you come in at the end and you're like, yeah, but the last 40 minutes cover everything else. <laughs> I've definitely got a few movies like that in my life where the ending is so good that it elevates you know, everything around it. So, yeah, man, I'm I'm down for it. Give it a 10. But don't get me wrong. I mean, there is stuff in the first hour and 15 minutes that I still really like. Mm-hmm. It just it's not like the last 40 minutes. Well, Brad, we've finished out Michael Mann. 
We've done it. I'd like to hear what you think. Can you rank the three movies that we did in terms of your preference? Uh, Heat, Collateral, Mohicans. Yeah, I think I'm in the same spot. Collateral on the rewatch was a bigger letdown for me than I expected it to be because it it just tried to do what Heat did and it did it more on the nose. And that really bothered me. Heat definitely got bumped up in my estimation. Like I never would have thought of giving it a nine before this watch through. Um, and I think this movie, Last of the Mohicans, might grow in my estimation on rewatch. But, you know, coming out of it really fresh on my first watch through, I think I'm in the same spot as you on ranking these, which is probably hurting Daniel in the heart right now. He just gave it a 10. And you and me are like, yeah, it's the worst one of the three. Well, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt me. What it says to me is that you guys just haven't watched this movie three dozen times like I have. <laughs> but, but it'll be there for you over the years. Exactly. All right. So that has been the last of the Mohicans. Brad and I are coming out to an average of a 7.75 out of 10, but we'd like to know what you think. So please reach out to us on our social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Film Whiskey. Or jump into the conversation on our Discord. We are on there every single day talking to all of you, the the people who love the Film and Whiskey podcast. So if you want to join the conversation, you can find a link to our Discord at the end of every single one of our show notes. Once again, we want to say thank you to our friend Daniel Joyo. Daniel, as much as you're allowed to share, what do you have coming down the pike for us? Uh, nothing definitely set in stone yet or that I can talk about yet. Ooh. But hopefully maybe another ringer piece about the Oscars in the near future. Um, doing an interview for Movie Maker that I can't – that is the, the, the former flame of someone we have talked about on this episode. Oh, okay. That's it. All right. I love it. All right. Well, then in that case, where can we find you to follow you when these things all drop? Uh, I am at Third Man Movies on Twitter. Uh, First initial last name on Letterboxd, which is D-J-O-Y-A-U-X. And I have an Instagram for my newsletter, which is You're the Good Things. I love it. All right. Well, once again, thanks to Daniel. Brad, this wraps up season six for us, but we're not quite done yet. We get to put all 32 movies from season six into a madness style bracket and eliminate them one by one until only one film can be crowned the season six champion. Our bracket episodes will be premiering next week. You can follow along with us on our Instagram page. You can download your own bracket and see how closely we resemble yours. As always, be wary of Brad G when he flips the coin of destiny when we are at an impasse uh, because that dude is a known cheater. So Bob, I don't mess around when it comes to fate. I can't friend. wait for our bracket episodes, man. It's my favorite time of every single season. Yeah, I, I'm super excited to get into it. This is this has been a really fascinating season, dude. I, I think that the director miniseries idea has been a lot more fun than I thought it would be. Yeah, me too. And I have no if idea. You guys post this 32 movie bracket on Twitter. I want to see this. Bracket. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we'll tag you in it. Yeah. Like, actually, I'll just make your name one of the entries in the bracket. We'll see how far you go. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So join us next week for our bracket episodes. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. 